you know, I was hesitant to write a book in the beginning um, because I thought, well, if people want to adopt some of the best practices of Jeff Bezos or Eric Schmidt or other super performers I've worked with, they've literally written books themselves. You can you can go and read their own words. But what I realized was they, I could write a book that they could not. One, because I've worked for three highly powerful CEOs, so I can see the common denominators between their their best practices. And two, and probably most importantly, is I have a I have adapted those best practices and translated it into a playbook for us normal people. You know, this is really the letter that I wanted to write to my 15-year-old self of <laughs> how can yeah. you be successful? How can you create the most out of the opportunities that come your way? And really to engineer your own luck. In retrospect, I can see were huge differentiators for me in creating opportunities. And the first is knowing what you want. Not enough of us take the time to sit down with ourselves and individually have that time, that, that um, investment in yourself to literally write out your own individual mission, vision, and value statement. Welcome to The Proud Talk. I am your host, Tracy, and today I am joined by Anne Hyatt. Welcome, Anne. Thank you, Tracy. Honestly, so for those of you that don't know, we were meant to have this conversation in person today. However, um, Anne is sitting in Spain in a lovely air-conditioned room, and I am sweating in the office. (laughs) It's not the way it usually goes, is it? (laughs) No, no, not yeah. at all. No, not at all. So for, for those um, listeners that, that haven't heard of you, Anne, and shame on them, but no, no, only joking, um, <laughs> that haven't heard from you, I would like to just give, um, I suppose, a bit of a, an overview for them. So you are the author of this outstanding book, Bet on Yourself. I can... I can honestly say I read a lot of books, a lot of books. So those that know me know I probably read six books a month. This one is one everyone needs to have in their life. And I don't even think I could put an an age on it. I think even from like if I had this book at like 14, 15, this would get me through life. (laughs) (laughs) It is. It was written kind of with that in mind of like if I could go back in time and give myself some sort of playbook. Um, this is what it would be. Yeah. I'm so pleased that you enjoyed it so much. It really means a lot to me. And anytime I see it out in the wild, like you just held it up now, it thrills me. I, I just, it, every single time makes me so happy. Oh, good. Well, I, I don't just have this. Everyone that works for me has this. <laughs> I went out and bought about five copies. So they all have one. Oh. And they all loved it just as much as I did. But not only are you an author, you spent the majority of your career at the side of three very, very influential CEOs of certainly our time. Um, and to name them, Jeff Bezos of Amazon, uh, Larry Page and Eric Schmidt of Google. You're also an inspirational thought leader, 100%, and speaker. But even though you've spent all of your time in rooms with these extremely powerful people, The part that really blows my mind (laughs) is that you're the daughter of the actual fighter pilot, Goose, um, who's the (laughs) character in Top Gun, as we all know. And you got to spend your your life living and being surrounded by the real Maverick and Iceman. (sighs) Blows my mind. (laughs) (laughs) I I love that that's... um... (laughs) You know, it's funny because when people find that out, it is often what they want to ask me the most about. They thought they'd want to talk about like Amazon in the early 2000s or what it's like to work at Google. But no, being Goose's daughter is my true claim to fame. That's true. (laughs) Yeah, my whole childhood was on Air Force bases. Yeah. Wow. I I think that the reason why for me it's also fascinating is my dad, um, I grew up, he was a private pilot. Um, I've been an aviation geek from a baby I think from the minute I went on a plane so and I wanted to be a fighter pilot um however being yeah asthmatic 
five foot nothing. Um, there were a couple of things that were against me. Uh, however, I um, I'm doing my private pilot's license anyway, so you know it's just in, a, in you know in a, in a Grumman and a Cessna uh, and not in a fighter jet. Very cool. <laughs> Very cool. Oh, that's still very, very cool. Yeah, I'm fo- I've, I'm five two. So yeah, those those um, fighter pilot cockpits are not built for us. I know. <laughs> uh, but, you, but you have flown in one, haven't you? That I saw recently. I saw a post that looked amazing. Yeah. So a couple years ago, I got the opportunity to fly with a former Blue Angel in um, wow. in a fighter jet. Yeah, and he after he saw that I handled it okay, you know, because I think most people are get very ill because it's so discombobulating the first time you're moving that fast. Um, But I handled it just fine. And so he really pushed it to the max. We pulled, I think that jet was capable of six G's. We pulled, we maxed it out. We did an air brake turn, which is where you go down kind of like you're going to land and then you flip it around really fast and take off super fast. And we pulled six G's doing that. And I did not throw up or black out. And that really impressed him. So I am goose. High fives. <laughs> but yeah, that post I posted it on Father's Day, and uh, a photo of of me in in that fighter jet, and I think that's one of my most popular ever. It was pretty cool. It's in the top ten moments of my life for sure. And I think it was quite apt as well, especially when um, I suppose Top Gun Two had been released, and and yeah. everyone sort of fighting to go and watch it, which was it was epic absolutely epic but growing up like what was that like for you because obviously your father must be a very strong character um to do the Mm -hmm. job that he does and be you know extremely brave at the same time I think you talk about in your book that a lot of your family have always sort of been dreamers they've always chased their dreams um Mm -hmm. and I suppose that's helped you along the way really hasn't it so much I When I first drafted out the book, I didn't start there, but I really found I needed to establish a foundation to explain how this very timid, (laughs) like regular girl from Seattle, Washington could possibly pair with some of the most powerful visionary people in the world. I really had to start at the very beginning, which is, you know, my ancestors moved, you know, from Europe all the way over to the United States, sight unseen, uh, to make their dreams come true. My dad, um, I'm first generation non-farmer, so my my dad was the first to leave the farming life and, and choose the military, even though he'd never been in a plane before. And he just was sure wow. that he could make this this dream of his uh, come to life. And that's a much longer story of all the obstacles he yeah. overcame um, and really, really beat the odds. There was almost no chance he would ever be chosen, but he was. <laughs> and um, But the other side of that was, even though he was, he's very brave, very capable, ridiculously hardworking and resourceful. I also, my mom was a really important part of that equation as well. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, being a military spouse is not easy. And she created that stability, even though we were constantly moving. Uh, She taught me to be really self-reliant and resourceful. I went to a different kindergarten, different first grade and different second grade, not only different cities, but completely different schools. And so you really, Mm -hmm. at, at a formulative age, where you're figuring out who you are and what your strengths are and trying to kind of establish that sense of identity. Uh, I had to do that in constantly evolving environments. And that, I think, is one of the greatest preparations for this wild career I've had, um, very unexpectedly in tech, was I learned that I could outwork anyone around me, that I could create opportunities for myself, and um, overcame what is my nature. My nature is very timid, and it was nurtured out of me through this military childhood and then watching my dad, you know, reinvent himself again when he went to law school. And, and then I started in tech, which was just pivot after pivot after pivot. Um, it really nurtured me into being braver than my nature would have led me to be otherwise. Mm. Yeah, definitely. I think, um, when I read your book and I just said this to you, actually, when I first listened to the audio book, um, and it was only into the introduction, and I just got this overwhelming um, feeling of being, I think, understood in a way from, I've always had big dreams, always. Um, and some people mm-hmm. are just like, Tracy, it's too much. Like, just, <laughs> just stop. <laughs> but I've, I've always been that way. And I think that's why I've also been able to pivot quite successfully and always applied myself. Um, but, you know, you you're quite right when you say in the book you don't need to go to university you don't need to go to silicon valley you just have to take a bet on yourself you just have to be committed and apply yourself and you know what i would love you to do if possible is 
for people that haven't read the book, can you give mm. them, I suppose, a brief overview of what to expect when, when they do? Yeah, I'm so pleased to hear that that was your takeaway from the book, um, that this could be applicable one to of, anyone. One of many. <laughs> One of many. <laughs> I'm pleased that you started there because that in and of itself, if people only get one thing from it, it is that. I, I you know, I was hesitant to write a book in the beginning um, because I thought, well, if people want to adopt some of the best practices of Jeff Bezos or Eric Schmidt or other super performers I've worked with, they've literally written books themselves. You can, you can go and read their own words. But what I realized was they, I could write a book that they could not. One, because I've worked for three highly powerful CEOs, so I can see the common denominators between their, their best practices. And two, and probably most importantly, is I have, a, I have adapted those best practices and translated it into a playbook for us normal people. So no matter where yeah. you are on this planet, what resources are currently available to you, what your background is, whether you went to a formal university or if you're in tech or if you're in a startup or you're working on something meaningful in, in your community, Regardless of where you're starting from, this book hopefully is a playbook of action items, of things you can do today. In fact, it was really important to me at the end of each chapter that there's literal uh, challenge exercises for you where you can mm. set some goals for yourself and then ask yourself some really important questions and create an action plan. Yes, I, I, I wanted to write it as like a story so it's easy to read and, um, and, and so that it, the principles are memorable. So it, it, there are some really fun stories from the foundation of the internet and the crazy behind the scenes things that we did to make what is now Amazon and Google come alive. But more, most importantly, more importantly than the story was for me to really translate that into best practices for anyone um, who just has that feeling in their heart that they're, they're made for something more, that they wanna take a bet on themselves and, and um, but have those you know, this is really the letter that I wanted to write to my 15 year old self of <laughs> how can yeah. you be successful? How can you create the most out of the opportunities that come your way and really to engineer your own luck? Yeah. And you absolutely get that from the book. And that's why, like I said before, mm -hmm. you know, this isn't for, for I, I can't put an age on this book and I couldn't, but I knew mm -hmm. that if I was 14, 15, if I'd have been handed mm -hmm. that book, maybe things would have happened even quicker for me. But it's brilliant. Right. So, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I had three kind of <laughs> categories in mind when I was writing the book. The first is for that person who's really young in their career. They've got some big dreams. You're kind of just exploring and understanding your talents and, and the mark that you want to leave on the world. So there's some actionable advice for those who are maybe in literally your very first job ever. Um, so how can you get recognized? How can you learn really fast? How do you choose those early opportunities and then use them purposely as a stepping stone to get to where you really want to go? Because most of the time, your first job in no way resembles your dream job. That's just how it goes. Then the second 100%. category of people are those who are, right? The, are those who are 100%. mid career. Mid career, you're wanting to be recognized as a leader. You're wanting to establish your expertise to get chosen for that big new client account or a promotion or just expand your expertise and your knowledge. So this is a playbook for that very critical mid stage of your career where you're you're looking for permission to do some really big things. And then the third is for my entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs. So if you've got a side hustle or you're really taking a chance on yourself and you're leaving maybe the corporate life to start something that's meaningful to you, whether that's a company or maybe it's a community organization, how can you as a solopreneur or an entrepreneur really convert your mission into actionable steps and get people to follow you. So those are really the three people, those avatars I had in mind when I wrote it. Yeah. Oh, and it's amazing. I love the book. I absolutely love it. Uh -huh. So as people will, will hear when they, they start to read the book, um, you nearly killed Jeff Bezos. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, <laughs> I won't go into that. I'll let them read that. But what was it like transitioning from Amazon to Google and sort of how did that feel for you? And mm -hmm. was it a similar culture between the companies? Was it very different? There are a lot of similarities. One of those, one of the reasons for that is because they had a, a foundational board member in common named John Doerr. John Doerr is an early investor mm -hmm. in both companies and he really helped instill some of the best practices they still use today. For example, they use the goal setting system called OKRs, Objectives and Key Results. So the way that we took on challenges, the framework of that was very similar in both companies. 
you had set a big growth goal for the entire organization, and then each individual was empowered to set their own growth goals towards that. And um, it was really important that that had a, a ripple down effect into every layer of the company. So that part of both Amazon and Google was the same, that kind of goal setting um, and moonshot thinking type of culture. With that yeah. said, the, the culture of a company tends to follow the personality and um, style of the CEO themselves. So those personalities are very, very different. So Jeff Bezos is, if I had to choose just one word, he's relentless in a great way. He pushes you every day to be your absolute best self. It is unforgiving. Like if he feels like you showed up today at less than your 100%, you're going to hear about it. But he does it in a way that it's reinforcing and empowering so much that the average tenure of his direct reports, his senior vice president, are 18 and a half, 19 years. That's how long they stay. Because yes, a lot is demanded of you, but you receive a lot in return. You grow really fast. You've, you're given opportunities. You're constantly asked to stretch yourself. So that tenure is there. But that relentless kind of pace and um, level of ambition is, is probably the way I would... Um, simplify what is a very complex working environment. And then Google is, while it is very relentless and unapologetically like moonshot dreaming level of thinking, Larry and Sergey, the co-founders, really set something that felt much more collegiate. They literally, you know, they started the company um, when they were in their PhDs at Stanford. And it does, the whole company kind of has that university campus feeling where you've... yeah. It's a little bit more playful and more creative. We have protected time for just um, individual thought work. In fact, at Google, we, I still say we, I have 12 years, it's hard to stop. I, I left Google almost four years ago, but I still say we. Um, but at, Google has something called 20% time where engineers can work on mm. anything they want using company resources that does not require manager approval, does not have to be related to their formal job there. And most of the products that we use today come from 20% projects like Google Maps, Google News, for example. All of those were originally 20% projects that then we saw, okay, we've got wow. some traction here. More and more of their teammates wanted to collaborate on it. They got funding. It became a formal project. And um, so uh, image search was the same. Image search was when uh, Jennifer Lopez broke the internet with her that plunging low Versace dress and everyone wanted to see a picture of it. But so we, the engineers are like, wow, we need to teach. This is before artificial intelligence was something we talked about around dinner tables, but they thought, okay, we need to teach the computer to see because people are searching, wanting to see a photo, not read an article from fashion week. They want to see it. And so, um, yeah. yeah, there's some really fun examples of 20% projects. So I think if I had to simplify the differences in the culture, it, it would be that. Yeah, and, and I only heard about this 20% thing yesterday. Oh, really? In Google. <laughs> um, yeah, literally only yesterday. Um, and I was just, I just thought, you know, well, I wish they, they do this in more tech companies, I suppose, yeah. especially from, from my past and my background. I wish that they would have implemented things like that. Mm -hmm. um, it, make, it, will make, it would have made a massive difference for sure. I think it's really important. In fact, I just read this amazing book called Grip, and I interviewed the author, Rick Pastor, uh, for my podcast. And he was a, he's a huge proponent of 20% time, of keeping 20% of your calendar open for inspiration, for deep thought work, for just kind of – I love how he articulated it. He said, most creativity happens between the verticals which is so true. Like when you're doing invoices or when you're, you know, it, when we're in the office together, those water cooler moments are so important. And so that doesn't happen if you're back to back to back, whether it's on Zoom or literally in conference rooms, those moments of connection and inspiration. And at Google, we called it cross pollination of ideas doesn't happen unless you've got space for that. So I'm a, I'm a big believer, yeah. especially if you're a solopreneur, an entrepreneur, leaving space for that will really take your work to the next level because otherwise it's yeah. just a grind and, you know, we, we can't raise the bar. Yeah. No, absolutely not. You, you mentioned um, someone in your book that I've admired for a long time on so many levels. And this is going to sound really weird. So... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you know, it sounds weird. Um, I've always felt, and I don't know why, because you can't find much on this person, but when I've read about him, or is, I've always felt connected. And I don't know if it's because he reminds me of my old sports coach. 
And that's mm. Bill Campbell yeah. that you mention um, in your book. And for those people that don't know um, Bill Campbell, read this book. And I know this is about your book. And so sorry. No, I highly endorse Trillion, Trillion, Trillion Dollar, Coach. Dollar Coach. Yes. Yeah. Written by my former boss, Eric Schmidt. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't even know what it is about Bill I think it's his no BS approach actually to mm -hmm. coaching in a way and his mentoring but I I haven't had that experience of, of anything like that with Bill obviously I don't know him and he's no longer here but what mm -hmm. was that like for you and why do you think his approach has worked for people like Eric Jonathan and Steve Jobs mm -hmm. Yeah, Bill Campbell was a very unique human, and he was a huge loss to Silicon Valley when he passed away. But he um, he did have a very unique approach to what he did was just really consult, not even consulting. I would just say, yeah, true mentorship and and coaching. He was a natural coach, so he literally coached football at university. He he was kind of this larger than life person who you could hear from, you know, way across campus. Um, but he led with love. While he was an absolute no BS kind of person, you couldn't, you couldn't lie. Even if it was a lie you believed yourself, if you said something out loud to mm -hmm. him that he felt wasn't the entire truth, he was going to dig into that. He would not let you off the hook <laughs> until we discovered the nugget of, of truth or wisdom or, or self-correction that needed to happen. But he yeah. did so with huge love. And not only for these powerhouse CEOs like Steve Jobs, Jeff Bezos, Eric Schmidt, all of the senior leadership at Google um, met with him very, very regularly. But for everyone around him, like even when Bill came because he had a meeting with Eric, the CEO of Google, he would first boom into our office and give me like the biggest bear hug in the world and sincerely ask me like, how are things going? What, what do I, you know, how can I be helpful to you? What doors can we open for you? What's frustrating you? What's getting in your way? It extended to everyone in this entire team, this entire ecosystem. Mm -hmm. You felt really, really seen. And I think a lot of people, when we say, oh, hi, how are you? And you're arriving at meetings, we don't really mean that. Bill meant it every time he was going to get mm -hmm. to the heart of it. And I, so I think that was the magic. While he was incredibly insightful, uh, had an, a great business mind just naturally, I really think, it sounds so fluffy, but I really think it was that. He cared about you being your very best self more than anything else. And yeah. you wanted to rise to that occasion. You wanted to see yourself the way that Bill Campbell saw you. And I highly recommend reading Trillion Dollar Coach because Eric in the book really dives into the methodologies, the ways he showed up and how he could really pull that out of some of the greatest thinkers of our generation and get them to their own next level. That it, it's, it was yeah. so beautiful to watch. It was a great privilege. Oh, no, I, yeah, I'm very, very jealous. And it's mad because I can't, I've never, he doesn't really have a lot of airtime. I don't know if he just never wanted no. to be at the forefront of anything. Mm -mm. He just sort of stayed nope. behind the scenes. <laughs> so yeah, I really couldn't find much. Yeah, no, Bill, Bill flies under the radar. But I think that was an important element of him being able to empower these larger than life you know, this, the concept of like a celebrity CEO did not exist when all of this started. When he started, mm -hmm. you know, coaching um, the CEOs of Amazon and Google and, and beyond. So I think he, he preferred that. I think it gave him some neutrality he wouldn't have been able to have otherwise, were he a prominent figure in the spotlight himself as well. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, amazing. <laughs> so working closely with the, the top execs, what are what traits do you believe make them all successful? I mean, we could talk about that for about ten hours. <laughs> but if I had to really boil it down, I do <laughs> on the have next a, one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. To be continued. This would be a ten-part series. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I think um, a couple of my favorite characteristics. There are some that really, really stand out as common denominators, and especially now, um, post Silicon Valley. You know, three and a half years ago, almost four years ago, I left Google. I moved to Europe, and I now do consulting with CEOs all over the world, across five different continents. And as a practice, I don't take two clients in the same industry. So I have one fintech, one health tech, one ed tech, for example. So even now, I, I can see it much clearer now that I'm slightly removed and I'm experiencing translating their best practices 
into different industries, different growth stages, different um, risk tolerances, for example. So here's some of the things that I've really seen as com essential common denominators if you want to be truly great as a leader. The first is humility. And when you think of these larger than life CEOs, that probably is not the first quality you would expect me to say. But it really, while they are, su they're supremely confident. They have the vision. They are determined to make it successful. But the humility comes in, in the way that they leverage their teams. So for example, I mentioned uh, earlier in our conversation how Jeff had these direct reports who stayed with him for 18 plus years. 18, 19, 20 years is average for his direct reports. Uh, that's an exhausting experience. <laughs> but they did it because of the way he managed the teams. He would, um, he demanded that every voice in the room be heard. He, um, there's something in Silicon Valley we call the HIPPO effect. HIPPO stands for highest individually paid person's opinion. And he knew that once the HIPPO had spoken, innovation and creativity stop. Because once you're that powerful, when you've been right that many times, if you're the highest individually paid person in the room, once you es express your opinion, debate usually stops. And he knew, he calls this um, day one. He wanted to stay in day one. Day one of a company, you you already, you're fully open with the fact that you don't have all the answers. You have no idea how this is supposed to be done because you've never done it before and no one else has ever done it before. So you're, you're, you're naturally very innovative. Day two is where companies get into danger, where you think all your ideas are good and all your jokes are funny. You, you can see around blind corners. You get complacent. And Jeff wanted people who would keep him accountable and staying in that day one zone. So humility is something I saw not only from him, but for, from Marissa Meyer, who was my first manager at Google. She was uh, employee number 20 and the first uh, female engineer ever hired at Google. She absolutely led with humility. She was, we were moving so fast. Uh, we were on the product team and in charge of launching all the things we use today. Like um, they had just launched Calendar, for example, like the week before I joined Google. This is back in 2006. Like literally things that we live our lives on. Um, you know, we were doing Street View and uh, all this live like navigation stuff. We were in beta testing at the time. So we had major, major product launches going on all the time. And she really led the team with humility of like, just, you know, let's go on data and she trusted us to get the right things done and create a space for that. And Eric absolutely did that in many, many ways we, we can get into if you like. The second thing I think is essential and non-negotiable if you want to be a truly effective leader is insatiable curiosity. You can't just fall in love with your ideas or the ways that you think things are going to go. You have to, I, all of these CEOs that I've worked with in Silicon Valley and, and now, the ones that are really effective are those that ask like, 100 more questions than a normal person would. I'm talking like, they ask you what seems like a surface level question and they dig deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper, especially when it's in, a, in an area outside their individual expertise. They just remain so curious about it and they, that's how they can connect dots that seemingly are so unconnectable is because they get into the nuances. Yeah. They see opportunities coming that other people don't take the time to see. They protect that open time for thought work. So if I had to pick just two, it would be that humility and uh, insatiable curiosity. But there's like, we could go on and on. There's many. <laughs> oh, there's so many. I know. <laughs> <laughs> With all the hard work and, uh, and, as sort of I know, what have been your toughest challenges so far and how have you overcome them? Honestly, it could have been really easy to stay firmly outside of the spotlight because the spotlight was so bright mm -hmm. uh, in the C-suites where I worked. It would have been easy, and I did do this um, to some extent for a while, where you feel those natural moments of imposter syndrome, you know, when people around you are just so exceptional and every, they seem to always know the answers and, and they do right things and they're, they're making history and um, it would have been easy to opt out of that experience. I don't think anyone would have blamed me. So probably one of the most difficult things was early in my career deciding, no, I want to fully participate in this. I don't want this opportunity to go by. And figuring out how to do that effectively took a while, which is one of the main things I want people to take away from the book is like, how do you do that? Especially at the beginning of your career when you don't really know. So I have a couple of things that in retrospect, I can see were huge differentiators for me in creating opportunities. And the first is knowing what you want. Not enough of us take the time to sit down with ourselves and individually have that 
time, that, that um, investment in yourself to literally write out your own individual mission, vision, and value statement. This is for your life. This is for, it, sometimes it can feel too overwhelming to do for your life or your entire career. So think about in this next phase of my career, maybe we're, we're halfway through 2022 right now. If we think about, okay, what are the next six months going to look like? What do I want to learn? What do I want to experience? And what expertise do I want to develop? Just ask yourself that. And from that, then in your daily work, you can see opportunities to experience those things. And it's going to take some bravery. But once you know what you want in exchange for all this hard work you do, it gets much easier to be brave to ask for it. So um, I think three things really helped me um, helped me translate the once I figured out what I wanted in my career. Um, you look for three things. The first is um, you want to... I think the quality of people around you is really, really important for progression. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I look for is I want to work for somebody that I not only like, but that I want to become like. Uh, we, we've all heard that saying that we are the average of the five people we spend the most time with. So ideally, your work team will resemble that. Now, not all of us have that, especially early in your career, you might be working at a place or for a manager that isn't who you want to be. If that's the case, then seek it out. Maybe there's a um, manager on another team that you might be able to shadow or work on a cross-functional project, or maybe that's available to you better in your community. You can volunteer at your local library organizing events or, or something that's meaningful to you, but really proactively seek out high-quality leaders that you want to become like and absorb their best practices. Ask them a million questions and be unapologetic about that. The second is going back to that knowing what you want. What do you want to learn in, in this stage of your career? And then take that to your manager. And I call this conversation the win-win-win. If you can outline for your manager, okay, here's what I want to learn and here's how that's good for you. You're going to be able to delegate something to me that will take something off your plate so that you can then step up and show up in a way that the company really needs you to in a way that no one else can. That's a win-win-win. My growth is aligned with your growth, which is aligned with what the company want and organization wants to do. You're going to get a yes every single time, even if it seems a little crazy or if it's outside the traditional confines of your job description. That really, really helped me grow in some crazy ways. Looking back, I'm kind of shocked at some of the things I asked if I could do. Um, but that's why I got a yes. <laughs> I worked on oh, all kinds come of on. things. You that need to give me I an example. <laughs> so, okay, an example. Um, so you alluded to the fact that I almost killed Jeff Bezos. We'll leave that as a teaser. Read the book. See see how that worked out. Um, but thankfully, that obviously wasn't the end of my career or his life at all. It's fine. But because I survived some early trauma that really made Jeff see me as somebody who was reliable, especially in a crisis, able to do the right thing and able to manage up to people very senior to me, he kind of gave me more rope than you normally would a very, very junior employee. So at the time, Amazon was expanding into new categories from for the first time. We were just expanding outside of books. And so we were launching into Japan uh, as a new uh, area. And then we were also launching two, categor two categories. One was jewelry and one was sporting goods. And so I said, hey, I would love to help out in any way I can with um, some of these launches. I am the junior most person at the entire company. Now, it's only like, you know, we were in a single building at the time. Now there's literally over 1 million full-time employees. But at the time, it, I knew everyone by name. So I said, hey, if I can be helpful on these launches, I'd love to. And I did not care what my job was. I just wanted to see, how do you do that? How do you even start on launching a category? What is it like to do a public like launch event? I wanted to see what the communications team did and the legal team did. And um, so I, I volunteered to do that. And I got to help participate in when we launched jewelry we did a collaboration with Paris Hilton who was at the height of her original fame mm -hmm. um, and she was launching a, a jewelry line and so we did a, um, a press event with her to, to get some good buzz around uh, the jewelry launch then when we were launching sporting goods just a little while after that we partnered with Anna Kornikova, who was endorsing a line of sports bras um, with the slogan, only the ball should bounce, which I still remember to this day because it's just the greatest like, <laughs> um, slogan for a sports bra. But I, even though my, my contributions were probably, you know, I probably just kept the lights on. I got to see, I got to be in the room where we were yeah. making history happen. And I had no idea yeah. what kind exactly. of preparation that was for my future career at Google when I would be running war rooms and doing launch events on a daily basis and really mm -hmm. having to cross collaborate 
And then fast forward 10 years down the line, once I became the very first chief of staff ever at Google, I was having to run these very cross-functional projects. And that really, I saw that modeled for me the very early, early part of my career. And had I not been brave enough to just get myself in the room, I, it would have taken me a very, very long time to be able to run those types of rooms in the future. So that's just one example. Yeah. Oh, that's another show. This is going to be 10 episodes, I think. <laughs> Now, you mentioned something there, and you, and you talk about it quite a bit, actually, on LinkedIn, and yeah. that's imposter syndrome. Yeah. And you're very uh, open and vulnerable about that as in how you talk about it. So thank you for that, because I think it affects, um, it affects everyone. And in terms, you know, it can stop people from ever progressing mm -hmm. anything. Mm -hmm. um, it stops people reinventing themselves. What is the advice there on, you know, what to do when that happens? Yeah, I'm so glad you brought this up because this is something that touches every life of ambition because the, the moment you get brave enough and step outside your comfort zone, you're going to have that feeling. So there was um, probably the most important book. If I had to choose a sliding door moment of my life of if I could have played it safe and stayed small, or if I was going to be brave and create a life of adventure and meaning for myself. It was when I read a book by um, Stanford professor Carol Dweck. It's called Mindset. And in Mindset, even if you just read like the introduction, it, it, I, I think it could change your life. So the first one is um, she, she introduces two types of mindsets. One is the performance mindset, and the second is the learning mindset. My nature is very much performance mindset. I am a perfectionist in every negative connotation of the word. I am so scared of showing up and disappointing people whose opinions I, that really matter to me. I'm terrified of not getting 100 out of 100. I am more than happy to outwork everyone around me to do the very best in the room. That is self-limiting yeah. because if you want to always get 100 out of 100, you're never going to do something that would stretch you beyond those capabilities so you will never grow mm -hmm. out of fear of embarrassing yourself or discovering it. So the, the performance mindset, which is very much what we experience in school, right? Your grades are all about like getting the most perfect score you possibly can. However, the learning mindset mm -hmm. is a framework where you believe that if I try today and I get 15 out of 100, I only perform 15% of this correctly, I believe in myself that now I've learned something I didn't know before, so the next time I try, I'll get 40%. And then eventually I'll get to that, you know, perf I, I'll have perfected this. And then it's time to move on and do it all over again. But that's about stretching it and not believing that I have this finite um, set of talents, but that I can grow them through investment, practice, pivot, and repeat. And so that was a huge moment for me in being able to do that. And so if you're having these moments of imposter syndrome, which we all do, and in fact, I tell a story in the book about Eric mm -hmm. Schmidt sharing one of his imposter syndrome moments with me, but we all do. If, if you're living an ambitious life, you're going to feel this. Say to yourself, this is an imposter syndrome. This is an imposter moment. I'm just experiencing this as a blip. It is not my identity. It is not a permanent diagnosis, but it's just me recognizing how far I've come. Like little Anne from Seattle would be so proud of me right now for being in this room or in that seat and being a little terrified. So when you reframe it that way of like, wow, this means I'm really learning and growing and, and stretching myself, it can be a reward in and of itself when you feel that little bit of terror. So it's a helpful framework. I highly recommend that book. Yeah. Oh, listen, it's one I haven't read. I cannot believe so that. Good. <laughs> So I'm gonna get it. <laughs> Go get it. Really, honestly, just With the them, intro. I'm, I'm, I've read it. I'm getting it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's done. It's ordered already. Love it's it. there. Um, With we were talking um, earlier, just before the show, of when you, I suppose, are working in that corporate world and you are non-stop there are sacrifices that, that we all make. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the sacrifices that you have had to make on your journey? You know, I, it's really interesting because the, there are some sacrifices that I think were essential. I, I could not have done what I did without making them. And then there's some looking back, I was like, I didn't have to do that. I didn't have to like really yeah. say yes to all those things. So looking back, I think it, it's learning to differentiate between the two. What is the absolute, like, I must mm -hmm. show up in this way to get what I truly want. And then how can I empower myself to let go of things that aren't 
an, an essential part of, of that growth. So for example, I think there's opportunities for us, even as junior employees, um, to say no to some tasks that really are just kind of noise. In my book, I use the framework that was popularized in the books in the book, um, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, where there's this analogy of rocks, pebbles, and sand. So imagine your life, yeah. your time, is a glass jar. So that does not expand or stretch, no matter how hard we try. In fact, we can break it if we try and shove too much into that glass jar. But all of your tasks are rocks, pebbles, and sand. And knowing the difference between them is really essential. So I am always a team player. I, I think my, my nature is to say yes to everything and want to be that single point of failure on the team. And I want to be, if I didn't show up today, this whole thing didn't work. That feels really rewarding to me. I love being that linchpin in a team and being the one that the team can rely on. However, if you don't do that smart, you're going to burn yourself out. And that's of no service to yourself or your team or anyone. <laughs> So what I wish I'd learned earlier in my career was how to identify which of the tasks I've been given are rocks, which are pebbles and sand. Rocks are the absolute must do. Like, and often it's just one, two, maybe three things today. And once you have that really clear, so when you're young, you want to say it out loud to your manager. What I hear right now is of all these things that I have, these are the essentials. This is what I must get done today. And, and when you're not sure of your instincts, just saying that out loud and taking that extra 15 seconds of clarification can be really important because maybe you think something's a rock and it's actually sand. So if we put in the rocks first into this glass jar and then the pebbles, which are the smaller tasks that are supportive and important but not essential, and then the sand fits into all those tiny crevices that are left just naturally. It doesn't, you know, that's checking email and maybe, you know, updating some small software, mm. whatever it is. But if you aren't sure that what you're working on is the essential rocks, you can waste a lot of time and energy. And goodness knows none of us have any time or energy to waste. So I wish I had said no to a lot of those things early. And I, I talk in the book about having some moments of realization of like, I am working hard, but not smart. So um, some of the sacrifices mm. are essential. So I worked in early tech in the early, early 2000s. We're talking web one. I was at Google probably in the first year of web two, and now we're entering web three. So this is very early days. I did work on average like 15 hour days. I did come in to the office most weekends. Mm. Now, a lot of that was essential back then. Like we were, it was make or break. When I was at Amazon, mm. we weren't yet profitable. We had just experienced the dot-com bust. The investors had lost trillions of dollars overnight, and we were fighting for our lives almost every single day. The reason I didn't burn out in that environment wow. was because the work I was doing was giving me really enriching experiences. I'm a big believer that your job should give as much to you as you give to it and have that be a decidedly high bar. So for me, I wanted to learn at speed of the internet. I wanted to learn from the greatest minds in the world because I knew even in those early years, I was exp experiencing history being made. The internet was never going to be invented again. The gold standard of e-commerce was never going to be invented again. And I'd probably like very few people get to sit next to Jeff Bezos. So I was receiving a lot in return for my time and energy. Yeah. Not to say it wasn't exhausting, but that's why I didn't burn out. And that's why I lasted 15 years. That's why I was at Google for 12 years, because I was receiving training, expertise, exposure that, that really was aligned with my passions of the type of executive I want to be and experiences I want to have. Now, that's also how I realized mm -hmm. I needed to leave, was because once I wasn't getting that same exchange for my work, I only have one gear, which is like all the way. <laughs> once that exchange wasn't there, it was... <laughs> It was time for me to go. It was time for me to choose another thing that would give me that exchange for, for my efforts. And so um, I think that's really important, especially now we're coming out the other side of the pandemic. We're trying to be very purposeful in the way we show up in this world. And so knowing what sacrifice you want to make, um, but the most important element of that is knowing what you want in return and seeking that out. Because it might, may or may not be where you are right now. You might have to get brave and seek it out. Mm. And, and I think, yeah, the, the most important word there is brave. You have to be yeah. so brave and in, start to enjoy that uncomfortable <laughs> feeling. Yeah. Did you um, did you know what you wanted to do before you exited um, Google? No. <laughs> My poor parents thought I was absolutely <laughs> insane. So <laughs> no. Is, is the so did mine. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> good, we're in, I'm in good company here. Um, no. So I knew that I needed to go outside of my comfort zone. You know, once you've worked at a company for more than a decade, 
all of my friends were there. I knew how to get everything done. I'd seen kind of everything before. I knew all the answers to all the questions. And while I loved it and I was good at it, um, I had that itch. Because across the 12 years I was at Google, I kind of reinvented myself pretty dramatically every three years or so. I had very different periods in my career and very different levels of responsibility. So I realized I needed to leave, and uh, but I did not know what I was going to do next. So while I was working for Eric Schmidt, the CEO and then chairman of Google, he had a, a personal uh, VC fund, a venture capitalist fund called Innovation Endeavors, where he invested in young entrepreneurs who were doing something at a community level. And a lot of it is very purpose-driven, like a lot of environmental sciences and things like that, that he just had a personal passion around backing. Mm -hmm. So while he had this um, investment company outside of our work at Google, sometimes he would tap me on the shoulder and ask me, hey, can you have a coffee with him and kind of chat through this struggle? Or I'd love for you to meet her and really coach her through something. And I just did it for fun because I missed that crazy early, early stage of startups. So I loved being exposed to like the next generation of entrepreneurs who were doing very important things in the world. And so when I left, I thought I was going to take six months off and just like breathe for the first time (laughs) since uh, 2002. Um, But several of those portfolio CEOs said, oh, great. While while you're figuring out what you want to do next, could I just bring you on for this project or this launch or this, um, you know, maybe they were doing a raise um, for investments, whatever it was. And before I knew it, I had a more than full consulting client list. And I realized, actually this might be the way that I learned some new things and I help some very, very important entrepreneurs along the way. So while it wasn't intentional, looking back, the dots really do connect pretty beautifully for me to be able to pay this forward and um, really help create some incredible changes that we want to see in the world through supporting global entrepreneurs. Oh, definitely. And you've um, you've certainly learned from some of the best in the world, yeah. which is great. And then you know, sharing that with, with all of us as well, which is, is amazing. And is that now, so do you work just with purely startups or companies that are sort of, sort of five, 10 years in, This is that sometimes can still be cast as startups, yeah. but <laughs> this is the hardest part is it, that's probably what took me the longest to figure out, which is where's my niche, where's my perfect fit in this growth phase? What, where I sit right now is really mostly with scale ups. So I'm post product market fit. You've figured out how you want to show up in the world. You're being very, very successful. Most of my clients have just closed Series B, Series C, so that's around $100 million investment. So it's really their race to lose. And you're doing something that's that's really passion line for me. I, I have the great opportunity of choice, so I'm going to choose... I want to be part of this change that I think is essential in the world. So um, I go in when everything is starting to break because that's what happens in this stage of success. All the practices that that worked for you when you were really small and in a garage no longer work. So you're, you know, breaking a hundred employees right now, and and the way you used to get things done doesn't work when not everyone knows each other by their first name or something. So I really help with that part of the hockey stick growth curve of. Um, Really, you're, you're in prime pole position and you just need to see around some blind corners. And I have the advantage of having seen that many times, not only at Amazon and Google, but now with many, many of my venture clients. Um, I can, And honestly, it goes back to something you brought up earlier uh, around imposter syndrome. A lot of them just want to know what they don't know. They're worried that they're the only ones who feel like this. They're the only ones who are like, oh no, everything is breaking. And it's just of great comfort for me to say, that's just what this feels like right now. That is a sign of success. That, or, you know, equally important, I'm like, nope, that is a red flag. Yep, we need to fix that immediately. Just having those gut checks um, means a lot yeah. to them. Yeah. Brilliant. Now, I spend a lot of my time, um, and I have been for years, sort of studying the brain and how it works, why we think the way we do, why we do the things that we do. And an element of me is is sort of seeing that we're in a way programmed to always be mediocre or in a mediocre type state. Mm -hmm. Some may agree with that. Some might not. Um, But some of the things that I implemented when I left uh, my corporate career, because I actually didn't have time to do any of them, like even just sit or um, (laughs) go for a walk or, you know, but really sort of, I started to to really make some agreements with myself that I was going to do these things without fail on a daily basis and making 
you know, the unfamiliar things familiar to me. And that really opened up my eyes to see, okay, this is the journey I want to go on. This is what I want to do. Did, um, well, I suppose two questions here. Did you do anything like that? Did anything change for you in terms of your well-being space or giving yourself some space after leaving corporate? And if so, what are the things that you've implemented which are just game changers for you? Oh, this is so important. <laughs> so important. Um, yeah, so I did a lot of things wrong. I very much burnt myself out uh, when I first became a solopreneur and then you know, hiring first employees and building up client lists. It's so hard to go from a beautiful corporate environment that's like a well-oiled machine to like, now I am everything. I'm the receptionist and the assistant and the, uh, and the HR and the everything. Like I have to write my invoices. It's so hard. So one of the things I did was I had to, I realized, especially in a job like consulting where you're give, give, giving all day. My, my whole job is to be thoughtful of you and anticipate your challenges and, and do very deep thought work. I have two hours in the morning that is now non-negotiable. The first hour of the day is about um, taking care of my body. So I need to move my body and I need some sunshine in my face because if I have those two things, I'm good. Like I, that really replenishes me. That's a big part of my satisfaction. Um, the second part is really about um, making sure that I'm filling up my mind because what I have to do for my clients is be very anticipatory what's happening in the market, in the world, what are the new tech, emerging technologies that they could be taking advantage of, what are some of the best practices and trends and conversations I'm seeing that apply to them. So I'm reading, you know, Harvard Business Review and I'm listening to um, incredible podcasts and I'm, I'm really seeking out these resources that are helpful to them. And I, it, it just so happens that I love that kind of stuff. In fact, my plan A for my career was to be a professor because I thought that reading and writing books for a living sounded like the greatest job in the world. I was a very nerdy child. <laughs> but I now is my way of expressing that <laughs> because I can do that and then pay it forward in ways yeah. that really translate into very impactful ways to show up in the world for, for these CEOs. So, but I find if I, if I allow one of those two hours to get overridden by something else, like maybe an early morning flight or something, I can't show up in the same quality that I want to. And so while that sounds very luxurious, right? Not, not every listener might be, feel like they have the freedom to protect, like carve out two hours in their day. I really started this for myself while I was still at Google working, you know, 15 plus hour days. I started some non-negotiable things in, in, you know, smaller doses. For example, I um, started working out for one hour a day. I told Eric, look, I'm now, this was very privileged already, but I said, I really need to move my body um, for an hour a day. So from 7 to 8 a.m., I was with my, my trainer at the gym. It was in the first floor of the building that we worked in. So <laughs> it was okay. It was, you know, I wasn't that far away if something really went down. <laughs> But it was so hard for me because I didn't, I wasn't looking at my phone, which I normally was for like 18 hours a day. And um, do you know how many times my, my assistant had to come down and get me because something really hit the fan and actually needed me immediately? Three, three times in like, in the, mm -hmm. I worked for Eric nine and a half of the 12 years I was at Google. Three times it actually was on fire so much that I had to run up to a board meeting in my workout clothes, fully sweating. Like that was okay. Um, but <laughs> having set that boundary... It kind of teaches people how you want them to treat you, and it helps them see that I'm investing in this. And, and I, I saw that. That was really well modeled. Eric spent all of his mornings, Jeff Bezos too, actually, now I think about it, they protected minimum one hour every single morning to reading. They always came in with um, Jeff in particular. He read the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the Seattle Times every single morning before writing, arriving at work. He was always reading a book. Eric was the same. I mean, how they consume the amount of, of information that they did is continues to astound yeah. me, but they did. And I think that is one of the, the keys to why they were so innovative and thoughtful and forward thinking was because they were filling their mind with ideas, especially outside of their areas of expertise. And then the second thing I've tried to implement is each of them in their own unique ways took time to really separate themselves from their work. So Jeff did that through quarterly thinking retreats. He would take one week every single quarter, and he would spend that locked away with no stimulus, no phones, no TV, no anything, just stripping his mind of external stimulus. And then he just brought a blank notebook and would just fill it with ideas. And I kid you not, today, the things that Amazon's launching, I saw in its infancy in those notebooks, like sometimes some of them 19 years ago. 
But if you don't create space for that, you can't be that forward thinking. And Eric did it in different ways. He would yeah. He would um, bring together these great minds and we would have these dinners if we were in Singapore or in Israel or something. We would just get the smartest people we could possibly find into a room together with no theme. You know, it might be we discuss AI or health or, you know, whatever it might be and just be inspired by each other. And so that those are different ways they invited new stimulus and created those huge spark ideas that from the outside you're like, how did you ever think of that? That's how they created space for it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and, oh, I love that. And I think it's so important that we have to take, even if it is, like for me, it's an hour and a half, you know, every morning. And when I think back now, like a couple of years ago, like why didn't mm -hmm. I implement it then? I mean, to be fair, I was, you know, on the train at yeah. 6 a.m. into London, didn't leave until 10 at night. And you, you just do consume yourself. But actually, did I need uh -huh. to be there? At, so I, you know, I still think there was elements of time that I could have made for myself, even at a lunch break, just half an hour. Yeah. <laughs> um, so when I look back, I think, no, I could have implemented some things I could have done. I think that's it. I mean, I felt, I felt the same. I felt like I had to be there 24 seven and I actually performed at a much mm. deeper level once I gave myself that space. Yeah, great example. If you can literally, if you step away from your desk just for 30 minutes and maybe you're going on a walk or you're listening to a podcast while you're running around or something, whatever you can carve out for yourself will enrich you and make you better. What In my experience, it never takes away. And mm -hmm. it really shows your ambition. If you share those things with the people on your team or, or your family or your friends, it inspires them and gives them permission to do that as well. So you can be a great example of just sharing what you learned or what you're doing or, or why that's so important to you. Teaches people to think of you in, in a different way. They're like, oh, I didn't know you were interested in that or how, how cool that that's a hobby of yours or something. And yeah, you get richer interactions. Yeah. yeah. Definitely, definitely. Who do you think has um, inspired you most up until now? Wow, that's a big question. So I have two categories of things. I have people that I actually know who are like my mentors and my sponsors. So a mentor mm -hmm. is somebody who knows you really, really well. They're exposed to your daily work product. They, they see your potential and they're a big part of their job. You know, normally this is your manager, but can be a teammate. Is they're kind of like giving you that real-time feedback. Then there's second category is a sponsor. It's somebody who's a step or two ahead of you, who's sitting at the tables you want to be sat at or who can open a door for you that you can't yet open for yourself. And then the third category is this kind of avatar mentor that doesn't need to know you exist. These are people whose careers you're following online, thanks to the internet, where we can just watch their progression and I can try and reverse engineer it because that's a stage I want to be on one day or a book I hope to read or a, a level of expertise yeah. I hope to have. So it... To answer that question, I guess I would have to know which category of things is standing out to me. Because honestly, I have had the enormous privilege of my direct managers fit all three of those categories. I think that's a pretty rare privilege to have been in. Okay, yeah. However, it might surprise a lot of people to know that those avatar mentors that I set for myself have really pushed me beyond. So for example, my avatar mentors might include mm -hmm. Sarah Blakely, who's the uh, first self-made billionaire of the company Spanx. I love her origin story because mm -hmm. wow, that girl can hustle. Like she did a yeah. bunch of things I never would have done. And she like watching, Definitely. right? <laughs> watching her journey makes me brave enough to be like, uh, you know, it. she a lot of the stuff she did is yeah. insane. I like sounds super crazy. I, yeah. I, I if you, listeners aren't familiar with her journey, uh, dig in because it, it's it's worthwhile. So she inspires me to be brave. I also love Brene Brown. Brene Brown is an academic. She came into it mm -hmm. very non traditionally. Her books, she had to self publish her first book, and it you know it did not go well. Now she's like an instant New York Times bestseller before they even come out. But I love reverse engineering. How did she get to that level? And that has. Um, helped me show up in some brave ways when I've just published my very first book ever and, and to have that vision of what it might grow into. So, well, yes, like my CEO, you know, celebrity mentor sponsors, um, bosses have been the greatest privilege of my life. I really think it's those avatars who don't need to know I exist, who inspire me to do something beyond has really made all the difference. And that is accessible to literally anyone. Just have to sit down and create like, who do I want to be? Where do I want to be? Yeah. And who's already there that I can reverse engineer the path and be inspired by? Yeah, definitely. And um, in terms of your book, actually, where did you find the time to write your book <laughs> with everything else that you've got going on? <laughs> it's funny because people ask me, how long did it take me to write? And I think if I'm honest, like 
seven years, I think, in the process, because a lot of it was, um, I just started speaking, um, very unintentionally, a woman just found me on LinkedIn and said, hey, I think your story sounds interesting. I just had a, a speaker cancel at this conference for chiefs of staff. I didn't even know conferences existed for chiefs of staff, let alone had I attended one or spoken at one. But she said, I think if you just come and share your journey, that could be really inspiring to people. And I looked on my calendar and that same week her event was happening in New York, I was going to be in the New York Google office anyway. So I thought like, what's the worst that can happen? I don't know anyone there and maybe I'll fail. So that was the first time I told my story. And it was the first time I really asked myself, what about this crazy roller coaster ride that I've been on is applicable to other people? So that yeah. was, yeah, I want to say like eight years ago. And then, so it was percolating. I, you know, stayed at Google for a wow. long time and it w wasn't until right before I left, I left Google in 2018 that I was introduced to the person who would become my book agent at a 4th of July party. And he was the first one who was like, no, you really, you have something here. This is, this is a story that needs to be told. Um, so anyway, I found the time because it was right around the time I was leaving Google. Well, I'd kind of, I'd written out all the descriptions and I actually got my contract with HarperCollins while I was still working there. It was in this time where I was moving. I literally sold, donated everything I owned, moved to Europe with just two suitcases and three duffel bags and reinvented myself. So while I was trying to set up my company and taking on consulting clients, I was also writing the book. Then the pandemic happened. And so then I would really have to, I had to split my time. It's kind of a longer story than we have time for, but um, I was working with my clients in the morning. Every single one of them was in crisis mode at the same time. So I would start literally at 4 a.m. and then go all the way until dinner time working with clients and you know, emergency board meetings and things. Um, then I would start my second job, which was writing the book. So after dinner, I would write until, you know, from seven until 10 every single day until I finished it. And, um, and then it got delayed. And then once I finished the book, it got delayed because of the pandemic. It was supposed to come out uh, last March. And then it came out this last October. And I'm really glad they pushed it by six months because I can't think of a better moment in time to empower people to make their wild dreams come true and to center on what gives you the most satisfaction and joy and pride in this single precious life that we have. So I don't know. I feel like those that eight yeah. years of stop and start and formulating stories and crystallizing best practices and creating this playbook came out when the world really needed it most. Mm. So I feel very lucky. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. I think so many, well, me, I left my uh, career first of October mm -hmm. and you know, it, for me, it was like this book <laughs> couldn't have come at a better oh. time. Honestly, <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, I'm, I'm one of many that have sort of left their, their, you know, career behind and sort of reinventing yeah. themselves. So you're right. I think it came out at absolutely the perfect And time. it was also crazy, right? I recorded the audio book, which you listened to last summer while I was in Barcelona teaching yeah. a master's course. And I got COVID right in the middle of it, like Delta COVID. I had a fever of 104.5. Oh, no. I could not literally get out of bed and stand up for more than two seconds for like five days. It was bad. That was in the middle of recording it. So if you, people like, people like my mom who knows my voice very, very well, she can hear the moment when it like <laughs> crept into my voice. <laughs> so you know, there's like around chapter six and a half, like halfway through chapter six, something goes really weird with my voice. And then I come back totally normal it's because I had to take you know two weeks off and recover from COVID and continue. so there was like it was not easy it was definitely a labor of love and you really writing yeah. a book is everyone told me you love having written it but you don't enjoy writing it and that tr turns out to be very true like it's hard to do that much uh self-examination yeah. and to really show up so I found that for me, a sweet spot, if we want to get into the nitty gritties of someone who out there who might think they have a book in them, is for me, I found the sweet spot was I, need, I needed four hours of time protected. Because if it was less than that, if it was like an hour or even two hours, I couldn't get into the zone because I was constantly distracted by what's coming next because I'm a planner, a preparer. And so my head is in that client meeting or whatever I'm doing after. But if it was more than four days, because at first I thought, great, Fridays will be my writing day or, or, or every Sunday wrong. It's that's too nebulous. I couldn't get into the zone. So if I had yeah. four hours, not more, not less, I could kind of spend the first hour reviewing what I'd written, getting in the zone, um, writing. And then the last hour I would be semi distracted. So for me, that turned out to be sweet spot. So my advice is figure out as fast as possible what that flow is for you. I'm sure that probably is not universally true. Some people might need mm -hmm. to take an entire week for a writing retreat or, or whatever, but that is actually how I carved it out and got myself through it because it's so hard. It's really hard. 
Yeah, no, I, I bet it is. Um, so this is the proud talk. What are you most proud of, of what you've achieved today? Oh. I love that question. Actually, I do a lot of interviews and no one's ever asked me that before. Um, so I don't have a, a go-to response. I think what I'm most proud of is doing something that no one like me has ever done before. Most of my career, I was the only woman in the room. Most of my career, I was the only person without an Ivy League, Ivy League education. Most of my career, I was doing things that uh, my parents literally don't understand what I do and can't explain to the outside person. I like that I broke the mold a bit. And I'm, I'm proud of that but it, because I hope yeah. that in doing so, I forged a path for other people who are underrepresented in whatever calling they are seeking, whatever industry they want to be a part of. If I want them to see that as possible. And I'm most proud of that, that I forged a non-conventional path and hopefully carved a way for other people to do so with less resistance. Perfect. I love that. Well, finally, if you go on a skydive <laughs> again or you have the opportunity to go in a fighter jet, please let me know because I would love to join Perfect. you. Perfect. <laughs> You're my go-to buddy now. Um, yes. But thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely, definitely. But uh, yeah, I'd just like to say thank you so much for your time and for joining me. On thank the you, Tracy. Talk. This is so much fun. We, I literally could have talked for 10 more hours. This is very fun. Yeah, me too. <laughs> me too. Thank you. Hey, if you have enjoyed watching The Proud Talk just as much as I've enjoyed interviewing, do me a favor, hit subscribe, like and share. Lots of love.